Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm talking to Rusty Egan, and the reason I'm talking to Rusty Egan is that there's the return to the Blitz. Um, I guess it has become one of the most legendary London nightclubs of all time. I mean, I can only think of a couple of contenders that, you know, maybe the Two Eyes coffee sh- coffee shop back in the 60s. Jeff but, Dexter. Yeah. Um, but I guess the the Blitz, which was over there in... It was actually 1979, wasn't it, it rather was, than yeah. 19... Everyone talks about the 1980s, but actually it was 1979. Yeah. And it ran for, what, a year, year and a half? Yeah, but what it did was it was a springboard, wasn't it, for yeah. the whole eighties and everything that came from it, and everyone yeah. who went to it, etc. And, and if you go to blitzclub.com, right. you can see my playlist, the songs I was playing, <laughs> which is which is so important. Now, um, this is very important. There was a, a character that came in the club once um, and tried to make me play his record, and I I wouldn't play it to the point where it, it caused a fight, <laughs> and. When you love your music that much, and you, 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 I mean, as a DJ and you're 19, 20 years old, and like I just said, you know, I find it hard to listen to Radio 1, I just won't play rubbish. I just won't play it. I don't care. There's no price that you can put on it. So really, the Blitz Club to me was like, look, this is the sort of music, this is what we play here, and if you don't like it, go away. Let's put it in context, because I think people... I don't know kind of how extraordinary it was. I mean, there'd been... You'd started at Billy's a little time before that over yeah. in, in Soho, and I'd gone, I think, to the first night of that. Yeah. And it did change my life. There's absolutely no doubt about it. I walked into this club. It unified everyone. Yeah, it did. It brought together a whole load of people. And it was in that period in time where punk had kind of run out of all its energy. Paul hadn't Cook it? had got mugged and beaten up in Shepherd's Bush, and we were scared to go out. And, yeah. and it was a really grey time, and people were up. beating you up if you dressed up and all yeah, of that. you needed somewhere to hear some bones some Lou Reed and who's Craftwork? What's that weird music? <laughs> yeah. So suddenly there was this place, and obviously music was one half of it, and the fashion was the other, and they completely came together, didn't yeah. they? They met kind of in these. First of all, in in Billy's in Soho, and then most famously at the Blitz in Covent Garden. But a lot of people. I think misunderstand it. They look back and they think it was a lot of dressed up rich kids. Well, <laughs> you know, like it was yeah. exactly the opposite. Completely wasn't it? the opposite. Exactly. Kids from Burnt Oak. It was. Yeah. It was. Uh, well, kids from Burnt Oak. Kids from the Valleys, like Steve Strange and Chris Sullivan. <laughs> yeah. Kids from Kilburn, like yourself. Well, all of them that had been um, sort of uh, after Bill Grundy and the Sex Pistols. You know, the, the whole excitement of the uh, punk, the Clash, the Pistols, the Susie and the Banshees. The whole excitement of that had left them like an open wound nowhere to go you get beaten up or chased everywhere you know i remember being in camden town going oh god here they come here the they teddy come. boys are coming oh, yeah. here they come you know and then you had the uh, what do you call them casuals yeah. you had them on a weekend oh so you were just where where the hell can i go and where can i hear some decent music you know so when did, how did you first hook up with steve steve strange that is well uh king's road saturday afternoon like everyone else wandering up and down there you know looking for whatever's happening going to seditionaries in and out of boy and get great gear market and of course you see other people that you think look good or oh, he looks good and hello mate what's your name oh i'm come from way with bloody hell. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly did yeah and so you two started this club together um, yeah and it, and it, there had been kind of bowie clubs back in the day hadn't there and it was sort of a continuation of that yeah crackers, crackers. had had its bowie night. well again uh, you know the, the clash said no elvis beatles or the rolling stones but if they said no bowie i don't think i would have gone to see them because <laughs> bowie has always been um and still is today yeah. for me he has never done anything even the tin machine i mean he's brave enough to do it but He's never done anything that went, woo, a little bit dodgy, you know. And um, he was the man. So at the end of the day, my record collection was massively Bowie, connected to Lou Reed, to Iggy Pop and and Kraft. Roxy Music he was as well. Roxy Music. So. There's your playlist, you yeah. know. It was, wasn't it? Because in the early days, there wasn't much electro stuff to play, was there? <laughs> wasn't it? Any, really. I mean, there was... Um, Popcorn, maybe. Um, Moscow Disco came along, didn't yeah, it? Yeah, a little bit. Well, at, at the time, don't forget, again, um, it's like a drum machine was not really that readily available. I mean, a CR-78, if anybody knows what that is, it's on Hiroshima Mon Amour by Ultravox, and it's the click track for um, In the Air Tonight by Phil Collins. It's just a little sort of boss and over thing that some guy in a, in a, in a, a lounge musician would do. You know, and you know he would sing along with his um, 
contempi or whatever you call it that kind of drum machines you didn't really but craft work if you look at their early videos they just had a guy with what looked like a pair of knitting needles <laughs> <laughs> but electronics in a club sound system is fantastic and the perfect example is Giorgio Moroder and I feel love yeah and now, the chase as well used to play and as well, obviously the soundtrack to the movie Midnight Express yeah. the chase um the point being though that when you're in a nightclub dancing you're not saying is that a drummer and a bass player you just want to sure. you just want the sound you want the beat to dance to so it was the perfect environment for electronic music to make now talking about perfect environments the blitz as a place as a building was anything but the perfect environment was it it was an old wine bar with pictures of sort of the second world war on the yeah. walls it was a bit scuzzy it was, it and was yet a, somehow it worked it was a theme wine bar um <laughs> back in the uh late 70s it probably was where um del boy would have aspired to have been yeah absolutely wish yeah having a little um a cocktail cocktail yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so who first came upon the Blitz? Was it you or Steve? Or no, no Biddy and Eve were at the Blitz. Yeah, so we went to see Biddy and Eve. And um, Roland Riveron was their drummer. <laughs> Roland Riveron who became Roland Rat, of course. No. No, no, Roland Riveron. Roland, Roland Riveron. Riveron, of course. He yeah. was their drummer. Yeah, of course. David Clarridge became, became Roland, Roland Rat. Rat. Yes, of course. He was one of those guys that was always inside a dummy or a, uh, <laughs> a toy of some sort or other. <laughs> and he saved some TV station, didn't he? But, um... Wh- at what point did you think with the Blitz Club, hold up, this is actually quite important, what's happening here? Oh, no, immediately. It was immediately important to me, Robert, because like you said, we had nowhere to go. And immediately the first night at Billy's, it was just a collection of all of the people that had nowhere to go that were all like-minded. Yeah. And as soon as you put the records on, the floor was full. Everybody was having a great time. You thought, this is it. We found somewhere. We're together, you know. And more and more people came, but we started to keep them out. We started to get a membership. Because there was only, if you think about it, what, maybe a couple of hundred quid, 250 exactly. couple of hundred. at most, really. A couple of hundred. But then you could say this same thing about punk yeah you could say say the hundred club in the summer of 76 yeah. 150 kids yeah. shane mcgowan and Polly Styron and everyone that yeah. went started Susie a band and all of that yeah. everyone that came started a band that's, well, that's what punk was you can do it start a band well that's what i mean one of the things i did with the blitz when i was writing writing the book the way you wore was to go through the list of people who were there that 200 hardcore who were there from the very beginning yeah and at least 150 of them went on to do something in their chosen field not all necessarily become yeah. famous but to do you know they became fashion designers or photographers or writers or graphic designers or musicians or yeah. whatever but uh, if if i could say as a as a dj that just loves going into a room putting on a record and capturing uh, a, a, a feeling of everyone in the room if i as a 50 year old man go to shoreditch I know I can walk into that room and I can put on a piece of music that I can communicate with 20-year-old kids. What I can't do to them is what nobody could do to me was tell me anything. (laughs) Nobody could tell me at 20 anything. So, the Blitz was a long time ago. Right. It why? Was. Why not suddenly? But why in the and then for a long time, it was kind of derided. People said, "Oh, it was just a bunch of overdressed fashion posers and all of that sort of stuff," didn't they? And we got loads of like stick. And would. people said, "Oh, the music was rotten." And and then suddenly it turned round. And there's a new generation comes along that absolutely loved the music and loved the clothes. And well, I, you know, um, where would Lady Lady Gaga be without the Blitz and all of that sort well, of stuff? Lady Gaga would be a singer songwriter. <laughs> sure. So let's put the fact that you you could put Steve and me here together with like chalk and cheese. I'm music, Steve's fashion. Yeah. It's fairly obvious. Put music and fashion, put entertainment and music and talent, put them together. Take them apart. You've got a little bloke in a room writing songs and you've got some um, drama school brat on stage going, oh, I can see, I can dance. <laughs> you've got to have the talent. You've got to have them together. You know, and that's, uh, it's like Boy George. Why was he called Boy George? Is he a boy? <laughs> the American said, what is it? What is it? Is it a boy? Is it a girl? I don't get it. No, it's the cloak coat, coat it was, check girl. It was shocking, wasn't it? It, it was, was shocking. shocking. Uh, what, what was shocking ab- about being young and dressing up and wondering wh- whether I'm boy or girl? Oh, I like that. <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the end result is, for me, for me now... As I said, go over to Shoreditch, and those people are digging around trying to find those records. Yep. You know, they, they can go online, and they can get 10,000 new dance records downloaded this week, and they don't want that. They're going, what was that record? Ricky's Hand. What was that? 
What was that record? Warm Leatherette. That was a great one. I've still yeah. got that on seven. Um, I've still got a lot of these records, actually, is from the original version. Did you keep all your records? Uh, yes and no. Oh. I, I digitalised my library, right. obviously, yeah. and I'm a laptop DJ, and I now carry 78,000 songs with me. So when people say, have you got it? Quite often I have, which I'm very proud of. And uh, and also, I used to carry six different bags, you know, of CDs right. before I went laptop. Or of records before yeah. that. But this is the one thing that gets me. There is not a Blitz Club album. No, there isn't a good There's one. a Studio 54. Yeah. There's a Cream. There's yeah. a Ministry of Sound. There's an Only After Dark Club in Birmingham, the Duran Duran Club album. <laughs> right? And, um... Bottom line is, I'd love to make a Blitz Club album. But what would be on the Blitz Club album that isn't already out there? It's out there somewhere. Well, isn't that's it? the point. The point is this. But I music- guess it would be you doing your actual set, wouldn't it? I mean, well, I would like to put on it the music that you can't actually get because if you go to blitzclub.com, you can see the list of all the tracks that I've played and give or take. 10 or 15 i think i've nearly got it right yeah every now and again i go oh my god i used to play that i used to play that every now and again a track would appear and i'd or i'd hear it go forgot to add that and graham smith's got a book coming out and uh, he's got the charts in it yeah and um i got a hold of a guy called robin kirby who's like a sort of um record collector guy and he got rusty you didn't play that in 1981 it wasn't released <laughs> I got, pardon that was only released in the seven inch version with the pictures and i'm like god he knows everything this guy so i'm trying to actually get together the blitz club album the album like david bowie singing heroes in french and german i've got it in german i can even sing it in german do you know i know the words so do i two conscious exactly we just love that song for immer und immer. yeah but if you went to him i said i want to release an album with david bowie in german and what else you want to put on it ricky's had, oh my god no one's gonna buy that so <laughs> You're back there this Saturday. Is it Saturday? Well, Saturday the 15th. Uh, you know the Blitz Club's so small, so yeah. it's sold out in sort of five minutes. Oh, is it sold out already? But what we've done is Martin Kemp's son. Yeah. Roman I know, isn't Kemp, this fantastic? I love this. Roman Kemp. Uh, he's got a band called I know. Paradise Point. Are they any good? They are. You can see them on YouTube, Paradise Point, right? And yeah. they were live at Steve's uh, party called The Face. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if we put him on the same stage 30 years after his father <laughs> and january the 15th is the release date of vienna right so we're also celebrating return to eden which is the return of ultravox so they're not going to be there is he is, is, is it Rusty? no is there's a book Mitch called return to eden right. a limited edition book which right. is also nearly sold out it's ridiculous yeah. it's ridiculous everybody wants this stuff now i'm quite, quite amazed by it so bottom line it's a 7.30 opening. It's not a nightclub opening at midnight, etc. Yeah. We're literally launching Blitzclub.com. because you're too old. No, I've got a gig. <laughs> Can yeah. you believe I've got a gig after it? I mean, I'm shooting off to DJ at midnight somewhere else. The point is, we're just launching Blitzclub.com. Yeah. Everything to do with the Blitz is there. Right. And we're going to try to well, get the Blitzclub Old photos and all that sort of stuff, yeah. We're going to try... And we're celebrating the release of Ultravox Vienna and Martin Kemp's son, Roman Kemp's son's band are going to play. And now you know who I'm chasing. I can tell exactly. Roger Taylor from Duran's son's band. <laughs> Has he got a band? They're called Night Moves. So I'm going, brilliant. you know what? Maybe 19 and 20 year old people want to have great music. They want to feel like it's entertaining. They want to be bands. I mean, if you look at Spandau Ballet, their last tour, which I was the warm-up DJ yeah. on, I went in the room at 6 o'clock in the evening and, like, a 1,000 people showed up, then 2,000, 3,000. In the end, there were 16,000 people waiting for Spandau Ballet to come on stage when I played Boys Keep Swinging. <laughs> and as they came on that stage, they showed a film of their Blitz Club days. yeah. yeah. I was standing on the wings watching them every night thinking 16,000 people a night three nights at the O2 I had no idea that Spano Bala had been so big yeah well it, it all, it's all very very big and can indeed, I end with one more thing go on then just for any British people here don't forget the 80s was the only time that we had more than 20 British artists in the American charts yeah I know that's one of the things that people forget people 
go on about the 60s there were more british char- uh, bands in the american charts in 85 i think than there yeah. were in in 66 or 67 it was quite extra- and most of those had some relationship to the blitz in one exactly. way or another had come out exactly. of that scene exactly i mean it was extraordinary it was an incredibly creative place and the man who made the music was rusty egan who we've been listening to here rusty thanks for coming in mate thank you so Robert. is it sold out completely people can't come yeah, but what I'm saying is log on to blitzclub.com yep. and we were, we've got to do something else because the intro.